Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. And today we're going to learn about uh, the VEX Robotics Tournament. Um, what happened there in the 2024 VEX Robotics Tournament from VEX Robotics Engineer, uh, in fact, Engineer at, at SOAS, H-I-G-P. We're going to learn about those things. And the uh, at Sea Grant College at, at UH Manoa from Adria Fung, who is, in fact, a robotics engineer. Welcome to the show, Adria. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me today. So what does VEX stand for? Uh, VEX actually doesn't stand for anything. Um, the VEX Robotic Competition is a competition organized by the Robotic Education and Competition Foundation. So they're an organization that manages and organizes um, all the teams and all the competitions across the globe. And our position here at, in Hawaii is really to just help to manage and support the local um, groundwork and ground efforts, um, supporting the competitions and the teams here. Yeah, you've been doing it for a while. So you, you've you seen the, the delta factor, the dynamic and how it's changed. How has the competition changed over the past few years? Oh, man, I think when so I was a student um, when VEX Robotics kind of just started up. Um, I was in high school participating in the VEX Robotics competition and our robots were pretty basic and pretty small. I mean, a lot of us didn't exactly know what we were doing. So we were pretty much learning from each other and all. But I've seen that as the years go on and the kids are getting um, smarter and smarter and being more knowledgeable of how to integrate robotic systems, mechanisms, computer science and coding into it. I mean, the robots are getting much more complex. Even at the elementary level, the robots are pretty big <laughs> for their age. Well, I mean, it's really interesting and it's fun for sure. It's a the the the, uh, the the intersection of um, science and technology and toys. There, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is pretty much like one. Yeah, the kids enjoy it. So, so you know, last time I actually saw robotics working at the university, I don't want to date myself. Was College of Engineering, Holmes Hall. Um, but you're not in Holmes Hall. You're in uh, So West and HIGP and the Sea Grant. What is? What are those organizations and what's their interest in robotics? Yeah, so um, I work in an organization called the Hawaii Space Grant Consortium. So we're actually under the HIGP um, department. Um, pretty much was started up to help give students um, in the undergrad level it's an opportunity to do a lot of these NASA funded uh, projects. So a lot of the focus for us here is actually on satellite work. We have rocketry going on in some of the community colleges. Um, one of our affiliates, uh, Guam Space Grant, is actually doing drone, um, a drone program out there. Um, so the interest is really in more of the um, NASA-related research and studies here. And so I work in the K-12 area where we're pretty much helping to push the pipeline of students that um, eventually decide to come into UH or enroll at one of the UH campuses and give them that opportunity to continue their STEM learning at the higher levels. How is it doing? Are you having more kids, less kids? Are the are the kids, um, you know, more Akamai about about the the technology of of uh, robotics or or what? I mean, we we would like to grow a huge crop of um, robotics engineers just like you, but but query is that happening? <laughs> oh, I I definitely think it's happening. I mean, we're we're trying to promote um, the fact that we have a lot of high tech um, careers in Hawaii. So kids don't exactly have to go away to college or go away to the mainland for these types of careers. Um, they can come back and stay home. They can do a lot of the work in satellites, like I said, or rocketry, or even just managing the telescopes or, you know, the local groundwork of how do we integrate technology with um, agriculture or community problems here. And I think it's really about innovation in Hawaii. So I, I see, as I see it, and I'm, I'm a neophyte about this. I'll always be a neophyte about it. I'll never catch up with what's going on. But there's three three things we ought to talk about. One is uh, the design thinking aspect. You know, what problem do you want to solve with with the robotics? And the second one is the the hardware um, and the material science and um, and I guess I would say the, the wiring. Because I know that's uh, very sophisticated. And then of course then there's the software that lives electronically within that device. So can you talk about those three things? Let's talk about what problems you know you want to solve, what functionality you want to achieve in the competition with robotics. 
Yeah. So um, in the Vex Robotic competition, um, the program releases a new game every single year. Um, towards the end of the school year, after the World Championship end, um, they release a brand new game. Um, and that's when students can kind of go on and figure out, okay, what exactly is the game that we have? And what is it that we have to solve? Um, build a robot to play this game for this upcoming school year. So the game is released around um, early summertime. And the teams either, you know, if they're really those um, overachieving teams, they can start in the summertime or a lot of the schools wait until the beginning of the school year to begin. And then really the kids are starting with the engineering design process. It's looking at how do we um, identify what the game challenge is, what exactly it is that we have to design our robot for, look on the internet, research, do a lot of research to figure out what exactly is our um, criteria and our sub problem. So it's really helping the kids kind of be computational thinkers. So thinking like a computer scientist or thinking like an engineer is dividing those sub problems out and figuring out, okay, do we have to toss the ball in? Do we have to do a hanging mechanism at the very end of it to get more points and kind of figure things out in, in that aspect. So what's the game this year? What was the game this year in the competition? Yeah. So the game this year is actually taking, um, these things called tri balls. Um, they are a strangely um, shaped ball. They're kind of like triangular shape, kind of like the shape of my hand. And they just roll around really interestingly on the field. So the teams will actually have to figure out how to manipulate these balls, either by grabbing it or intaking it and then scoring it underneath um, a goal zone. And then there's other obstacles on the field, like a PVC pipe that the robots will either um, you know, traverse over or they have to go underneath this hanging bar in order to get over to their goal side. And then pretty much the um, objective of the game is to score these balls into the goal zone. And at the very end of the game, there is um, a hanging um, end game uh, bonus. Well, that sounds hard because you have to know the, the physical, the kinetic characteristics of this object, whether it be the funny, the funny ball or the, or the rolling pipe or whatever it might be. Um, how, how do you determine, how do these kids determine um, the kinetic characteristics, the way the thing moves? I think a lot of it is actually through testing. A lot of the schools have a field in their um, classrooms or their robotics lab. And pretty much what they're doing is really prototyping different kinds of dry bases, different kinds of mechanisms, and just testing it and collecting data on it and figuring out what is our best prototype or our best mechanism that we can use for the competition. And that's how they pretty much iterate and go through this engineering design process to design their robot. You know, if I was a videographer, and P.S., I am a videographer, um, I would say, why don't we take this funny looking ball and take some video of it and see the way it moves and, me <laughs> and measure the moves as they as they are recorded on the video and, uh, and, and, and put that into metrics. Do you do that? I think the capabilities of the VEX robotic system are still at the basic um, secondary school level. So I don't think we're at that point just yet. But if we do have possible university or professional organization teams, oh, I'm for sure they'll, they'll take that type, that type of data and be able to man manipulate that ball. Okay, so um, now these kids come in and uh, they're part of the competition. Uh, oh, oh, I wonder, is, you know, in March or April, they have the science fair. Mm -hmm. They're the same kids who, who develop these robots and these teams also, um, you know, demonstrate their work in the science fair? I think some of the students actually do. They actually enter the science and engineering fair. Um, I'm not sure that they use specific, this specific kind of robotics since it's for robotics competition per se, but some kids might use the actual VEX robotic parts or the system behind it, the hardware, the electronics, and then possibly do an engineering project with it. So a lot of the students actually cross over to different kinds of STEM programs within their school. So they not only do robotics, they might do, like you mentioned, science engineering fair or even future farmers for the first robotics competition. Sure, it all crosses over trying to make technology work for us. Well, so let's go back to the parts now, okay? <laughs> um, I remember that um, the parts will come from the mainland, from organizations which make parts. And uh, you open up a catalog and uh, there's lots and lots and lots of parts in there. And 
and somebody's manufacturing them, and the the job of the uh, editor, if you will, um, is to identify the parts that he or she needs in order to uh, achieve the, the physical robot. Am I right about that? Pretty much. All the parts come from the VEX Robotics uh, system. So what kind of parts do you buy? I mean, um, it, this you know, what I'm thinking is that it, if you're going to compete, you are going to have the best physical device you can have. You want it to be smart, fast, strong, all that. Um, so do, the, do those factors enter into the selection of the parts? Pretty much, yeah. Um, I mean, that, the VEX robotic system is really, um, it was really designed as a easy entry point for a lot of the schools and organizations to get into robotics. So they try to make the parts um, as simple and as um, easy to learn as possible. Um, we're not talking about custom 3D printed parts or laser cut water jet types of parts. That's for, you know, a different kind of composition. But this is more for that intro level uh, robotic kind of student. So the parts that they would buy would be things like aluminum or steel um, C channels or chassis. There's um, screws, nut bolts um, that they had to pick up. And then in order to make things move, they have to pick up things like motors, um, the brain, the controller that interfaces everything all together, possibly sensors, um, gears, chains, sprockets, everything to pretty much make their robot move. So if you break down all of those parts into its own individual components, um, the kids will learn pretty much the functionality of each part. And then it's really cool to see the students be able to figure out, okay, if we use this part exactly how it was designed to be, and not just using putting a bunch of wheels at the end as counterweight, but actually designing it with, um, you know, a center of gravity in mind for the robot. I think they'll see that the robot is going to be much more um, structurally sound when it comes to going into competition. So it's really neat to be able to see the kids kind of design and think in that way, to think and design first without just going into the building of it. How much um, help do they need? How much teaching do they need? Uh, how much, you know, counseling and uh, advice and consultation do they need as they as they go down, you know, the development uh, trail here? And um, how 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 is all of that different from K to twelve? Yeah, so um, we have a committee called the Hawaii State Vex Planning Committee, and it's made up of volunteers. It's also made up of event partners, people who host the tournament, um, current coaches, retired coaches like myself. Um, and we pretty much help to support the local community by providing things like workshops, um, grant opportunities, resources even. So we really like to be able to work directly with the coaches and directly with the team to kind of give that, to give them that foundation. I mean, the VEX Robotics competition, a lot of the teams kind of um, use after school time to figure out their robots and design it. And so we completely understand the teacher's busy schedule. I mean, working with a lot of the elementary and middle school teachers too, they're just, their plate is just so swamped with all the work that they have to do through the school day that, you know, we really want to be able to at least help give them that support after school. So that way the kids are, they, they feel confident with that kind of knowledge going into competition and they feel much more confident talking with other teams and also the judges too. Oh, you know, you talk about confidence, uh, my recollection of the um, science fair, science and engineering fair is the biggest takeaway on that is that kids can get to explain what they've done. And uh, this is a tremendous uh, a benefit from the science fair because otherwise they might be shy and they, and, you know, they wouldn't be able to tell a third person what they've done. Is there a time in the development of the robotics devices where these kids can explain what they've done? Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's definitely built into the competition. Um, a lot of the teams actually go and do multiple competitions throughout the school year, not just the one, you know, presentation or competition. A lot of them actually do two or three um, competitions throughout the school year. So it gives the kids the chance to go through the engineering design process uh, multiple times to refine and design their robot. They have to talk it out within their team members to figure out who's doing what. So that's where communication and teamwork comes into play. Plus, also, they have to do another aspect at the competition, which is the judging and engineering notebook portion. So the kids are documenting in their engineering notebook what they've done, how they designed their robot. 
they turn that into the judges at the beginning of the competition. And then the judges, after reviewing their notebooks, go out and actually go and ask the kids these questions. So you definitely see the kids build their confidence level and their speaking and communication levels um, throughout the school year. And it's amazing to see what, you know, they come up with at the very end at the state championships. Let's talk about the teams. How big are the teams? And what do the teams do together? And um, what, you know, what kind of exchange do the the teams have intrinsically and extrinsically with other teams? Yes. So um, this year we have a little over 250 um, teams in Hawaii from elementary all the way through high school. Um, The ones that participated in this recent um, Vex Robotics competition, they were at the middle school, high school level. So we had a total of 28 high school and 16 middle school teams that qualified to the championship. So the teams are made up of roughly, I would say, three to four members, three to four students of their team. Um, A lot of them are, you know, um, have been doing robotics for the last couple of years. We have a lot of brand new teams, brand new freshmen that come in that, you know, have no idea what they're doing, but it's really neat to see that um, the network that they have within their school first. So for example, um, we have a few schools that have say a freshman only team and then a veteran team. And it's really neat to be able to talk with say the freshman team and hear of the impact that the veteran students have um, towards the freshmen. So being able to give them the kind of knowledge that they need. So that way when the seniors leave, the freshmen who now go into their sophomore year can continue this robotics program. And it's also really neat to see um, the, the team um, collaboration throughout the different kinds of schools. So these teams are seeing each, um, all these other teams almost, almost every other weekend throughout the school year, especially at the high school level, to the point where all of the team members pretty much know all the other team members of a different school on another team. So they're actually collaborating and, you know, like going on various uh, forums, community types of social media, and just collaborating with each other and figuring out what is the best kind of strategy, um, teamwork, how do we figure out um, this? If they have, if one team has a specific problem, then they can go to another team and say, we're having this coding issue. Can you help us out with this? So it's really neat to see, especially during um, the championships where there's not really a separation of the team. I mean, it is still a competition and it's very competitive, but you know, the, we saw one team, what a middle school team where they actually yelled out to their opponent on the other side. And they said, Hey, you have a really cool robot right there. <laughs> awesome job. <laughs> so for a middle schooler to actually say that to their opponent, I mean, the middle, th- those middle schoolers are, they're in a really great uh, foundation right now. Oh, yeah. It sounds really terrific to be involved. So let's talk about being involved. You know, you mentioned a couple of things. One is coaches um, and judges, and you mentioned grants. And those are all, you know, third-party participations. So what is it like to be a coach? Um, maybe all the coaches just like you, or maybe they come from outside. Um, and, and the uh, judges, are they, are they science and technology people? And finally, if I feel that I want to help this pro- project, um, can I be a grantor? Um, would you would you look to organizations in the community for money? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's definitely taken um, a huge village to pretty much put this program together. Um, it really starts with the teachers at the schools that are willing to be coaches, right, for their for their students because they see this this really neat opportunity for their kids to be engaged in this robotic platform. Um, And then so from the schools and from the students and the coaches, you know, a lot of the schools do have really great support from their administration. Um, For the coaches that want to do more for their community, they can be something, uh, they can take on a role called an event partner, meaning that they host one of the tournaments that the teams would come to and, you know, try to get qualification to the championship level. Um, It's really the event partner's responsibility um, to find um, community members, reach out to volunteers in their community, in their parent organizations, from their schools, to be able to put a competition together. So you're looking at people not only um, as judges. So judges are made up of science, engineering people, but also community members, teachers even, uh, folks from the DOE complex offices as well. Um, but we also have other volunteer roles, such as refereeing, 
um, emceeing. And so those are a lot of them are just made up of community members that this event partner has built together um, as part of their network. Um, and then it's also part of the coaches or event partners responsibility if they want to find sponsors for their own program. So especially for the high, high school level, a lot of them do travel outside of um, Hawaii. Some of them travel to the neighbor islands for competition, but a lot of them do travel to play the world championships or even internationally like to competitions in Japan. So um, a lot of the coaches really try to um, put in that kind of work to find sponsors and find grants to be able to support their program so I mean we give a lot of a lot of um you know pat on the back to the to the coaches I've been a coach myself so I totally understand so from our um point at here at Hawaii Space Grant we really try to support the education side so really just the foundation knowledge so that way the coaches can you know put on that kind of time or devote their time to to supporting their programs in other ways but the competition itself uh takes place at local schools, right? Uh, no, this is not outside. This is inside the school, and, and the school provides the space and, uh, you know, organizational assistance, I expect. Uh, can, you, can you talk about how the competition works and how it worked, worked this year? Um, you know, there are various grades, of course, and are they separate competitions? Uh, and, uh, of course, I want to ask you, who won? Uh, I, I need to know who won and why they won. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so the VEX Robotics Competition, there are two um, levels. So one is called the VEX IQ Competition. That's for elementary and middle school level. They use plastic parts to build their robot. Um, the VEX IQ Championships will actually be later on uh, over President's Day weekend at Evamakai Middle School. Um, it's open to the public, so families and the community can come and attend. Um, the middle school, high school level is called the VEX Robotics Competition. And those are the teams that use the metal part. They have to do use screws and nuts in order to like secure their robots. Um, the competitions start around the September, October timeframe. And in this year ended at um, late um, January. And so what we just had was um, the VEX Robotics um, Regional Championships. So this is the culminating event for the middle school, high school level competition where the teams that qualified from the local qualifying events at the schools um, make it to the regional championships. And so at the regional championships, we awarded uh, four slots from the high school and three slots from the middle school to the world championships in Dallas, Texas, which is going to be held in late April. So the teams that won at the high school level um, were two teams from St. Louis School, um, the Milani Mex team, which is a home organization team, um, and also Nanakuli High um, and Intermediate School that are going to the World Championships. And then at the middle school level, it was the two Wailua teams from Wailua um, High and Intermediate School. And then we also had Waianae Intermediate School. So the teams that won um, or won the slot to the World Championship, um, part of it was the performance side. So they were the tournament champions of the entire event. After the teams go through their qualifying matches throughout the day, um, they actually have to um, do an alliance selection. So they go through an alliance selection to figure out who they want as their alliance partner. And then they go into pretty much a quarterfinal, semifinals, and then the final round of competition. So we have the performance aspect of it. And then the excellence award, which is the highest award a team can receive at um, the Vex Robotics competition that celebrates the team's um, dedication to their engineering notebook, to the design process, um, their communication, teamwork skills, and also partially um, performance side as well. Um, the winners of the Excellence Award uh, were also awarded a slot to the World Championship too. Wow. Yeah. Oh, if you, if you get into the World Championship and even win it, possibly, um, then um, you, you get a you get a prize of a million billion. Um, do they give you money? What happens to you? They, I guess uh, somebody flies these kids to Dallas. Um, but after that, um, are they guaranteed to have a, a scholarship at some, you know, important engineering school or what? What, what are the benefits? So I think the benefits of going to the VEX World Championships, I, I mean, I took my teams there for two years and it's such a huge event. There's over 3,000 teams in this one arena that 
you know, you you get to see all these teams from all different kinds of countries come to this one place to compete in the same game that you've been playing since the beginning of the school year. So the teams that um, end up going and end up, you know, winning in their division and all, they get to go into the final rounds um, in this um, dome area where it's kind of like a party in a sense. There's confetti, there's like dim lights, strobing lights and all. Um, and so the teams that win it, I don't think get any kind of money, but they do get bragging rights from their school. Um, they might possibly get what I think the teams are really after is a ticket to the next year's world championship. So that way they don't exactly have to go through the same process all over again. But the teams, I mean, go through this engineering design process so much that they're just experts in, in their robot. So to be able to communicate and network with other teams from other kinds of countries, it's really valuable for the kids. And there are a lot of scholarships too that are open for high school students to apply. And they make friends, and the friends are long-term, right? Yeah, pretty much. I made friends from Japan, from Korea, Kazakhstan when when oh. my team went to the World Championship, and we still we still keep in touch, too. So really, this network is huge. You know, one thing I've noticed is that when you see a kid really put his heart and soul or her heart and soul into a project, a competition like this, a team like this, it's not temporary. It defines that kid all the way through through K to 12 and beyond. And, you know, in uh, college, uh, graduate school, what have you, and in career. Am I right? Is that what happens here? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we've been tracking a lot of the students since they were doing robotics since fourth grade even. And to see the kinds of careers that some of them are, you know, going into, whether it's being an avionics engineer at the Hawaii Space Flight Lab, or being an engineer at Hawaiian Airlines, um, managing um, projects at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab in NASA. Uh, I mean, it's it's huge. The impact is huge, and I can definitely testify as I was a student too in robotics that it's had a, it's had a huge impact on me, and it's neat to be able to still keep in contact with people who are in robotics as well. Well, we mentioned um, you know the different elements of how you how you build a, a robotics device. And uh, I'll refresh my own thinking about it. You know, one is the design, um, two is the the hardware, and um, uh, three is the electronics. And I guess um, somewhere in there is uh, is software. And uh, I remember watching some kids put robotics devices together, and they were on computers designing software. And uh, now, it, just me now, just me, I always think that software is what really drives um, and that when you get down to the fine point of a competition and see how the device operates and how it handles, you know, differential conditional circumstances, it's the software that wins the game. Am I right? I think it's both. Um, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely a good balance of software. Um, when I was doing my robotic uh, engineering um, schooling in college, we were taught that robotics is made up of three legs of engineering. So the first leg is mechanical engineering, second leg is electrical engineering, and the third leg is computer science. So, you know, you cannot just develop software for a robot if you don't exactly have a built robot to begin with. But the software is what makes the robot think or move or do what it's supposed to do. So definitely the three legs come into play um, all together when it comes to designing, designing a robot. So the question is, <clears throat> what language are they learning for this? Is it standardized language? Um, are, are there libraries of functions they can, um, you know, take from? Um, and uh, what kind of consultation and coaching uh, do they need, do they get in terms of developing software? Because some of these kids, you know, they might be good at computer games or social media on their phones, but they have no clue about software. And you have to teach them about software right down to the lines of code. That's, that's a learning curve, if I, if I may. Um, how does that work? I think it really just starts with the foundation um, elementary level. So at the elementary level, uh, the kids are programming with um, something that looks like scratch coding. So block-based, they're just dragging, drag and dropping the blocks from the window into their actual code itself. So telling the robot, all right, drive forward, turn left, go forward, turn right kind of thing. So very basic, um, very basic 
um, level of coding at that point. But the kids are starting to understand the algorithm behind it. So from block coding in the Vector Robotic uh, platform, they're able to either go into Python, uh, which is text-based, or even a more, you know, C or C++ as well. So both Python, C, and C++ are professional um, coding languages. And so the kids would, you know, once they start to understand the basics of coding and algorithms and the foundation of computer science, then they can start to build their code and text over time. And there's so many different kinds of resources um, that they can tap into. I mean, just talking with other students when they go to the competition, a lot of them are showing them different kinds of functions that they've used for their robot, or they can go online and ask a question in the VEX Robotics forum and get an answer that way as well. Um, so there's so many different kinds of resources for kids to tap into. And really the coaches um, are there to just kind of help the kids through the, with the foundation knowledge of computer science first. Um, I like to teach um, the coaches and also the students about flowcharts of how to start planning your program and all. But really after that, the kids, they're so smart. They're so resourceful too that, you know, they can even go on like social media and ask a question of coding and they might get an answer right then and there. So everything is right at their, right at their fingertips. Like yeah, they, literally. Might, they might get somebody to tell them something that you can't. <laughs> so you know the thing about uh, software is that once you get into say C plus plus, um, you know you have you have broken a barrier. Now you understand what it looks like and what it can do and what kind of functions are available to you. The power, if you will, of the language. And so once you've done that, um, you've entered into a new world of thinking. You know, coding is a new world of thinking. And once you break into it, it you know, uh, then you can go, what do they say, to the moon. <laughs> you, can, you can do anything once you understand how it works. So I think this is a tremendous benefit for any kid who's involved in this, uh, this activity, this tournament, this competition. So, uh, Adria, uh, where is it all going? You know, you, you know nothing... Nothing stays the same. Everything changes. We know that's an engineering principle, if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, where is it? You've seen it long enough. You've been involved in it up to your eyeballs long enough to know where the whole where the whole thing is going. Um, can you give us a handle on what you expect over the next, say, five years? Yeah. So, um, I mean, what I like to always um, educate teachers and coaches in robotics is that Robotics is really just the vehicle where we can help, you know, help the kids apply things that they're learning in their classrooms, like math, English, social studies, even into robotics. But really, it's having the students learn about the foundations of robotics. So, for example, what is this kind of hardware doing and how is it interfacing with the software along with sensor integration and all? And it's really getting the kids to understand this kind of pattern of hardware you know, software, electronics integrated into it, where we want to be able to encourage students to be creative, right? So like in Hawaii, I think innovation is going to be the next big um, field where the students have having this kind of knowledge in them helps them to figure out exactly, you know, how they can put this all together to solve a local community problem. And so we know that the problems are always changing. Um, but we still have fields that um, robotics can definitely play a part in, such as healthcare, um, agriculture, um, community problems, cleanup, you know, pollution. There's so many different kinds of avenues. But I think what's most important is having the students understand this kind of basic engineering knowledge first and then being able to apply it in different kinds of scenarios. So, I mean, like you said, like we don't exactly know what's going to happen in the next five years, but if the kids are equipped with this kind of knowledge and foundation and tools, then they can solve any kind of problem that they're being thrown at them, just like the competition and the game. Isn't that the truth? I, I'm remembering um, a demonstration of a robotic boat um, that a team under Margot, Margot was the, um, uh, she was the dean of uh, SOWEST for a while. I don't know if you know her. Uh, she's an extraordinary woman and scientist. And she, um, she supervised the, the development of a boat that would move around the harbor uh, here in Hawaii. And since, with using a combination of sensors, um, and it was all automated. I mean, it was just 
completely automated. Um, and it would, would check out what was in the water, whether there was any dangerous material in the water, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, problem that could result in damage to the harbor. And um, this was from Hawaii. And they wound up selling this boat to various other cities uh, that, um, you know, needed, needed that kind of functionality in the harbor. So you let your mind fly. And uh, I am hoping that part of the dynamic we're talking about is that the games that are being, you know, assigned to these competitions will be broader and wider and deeper and more creative uh, to start with. And I hope that happens. Do you hope that happens? I definitely hope so. I think the competition games are a good start, but it's really neat to be able to see the students combine what they have and then being able to solve a local community problem that really impacts um, their community in Hawaii. And I think that's going to be the biggest, um, the biggest thing for the kids to take away from this. Well, thank you, Adrian. It's great to talk to you. You're, uh, you're really a great guest on these shows and I certainly appreciate you, uh, participating with me and telling us, uh, how, how all of this works. It, it, it makes me want to go back to school again and, and sign up for the robotic <laughs> program. Sure, we can have the Think Tech Hawaii team versus Fader our next competition. Uh, there you go. Adrian, Adrian Vung of um, the robotics program at UH Manoa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Aloha.